May 28, 1901, Mazafa al-Din Shah Qajar, the Shah, an autocratic ruler of Iran, had granted an oil concession to a British entrepreneur named William Knox Darcy. The concession granted Darcy the exclusive rights to explore, exploit and refine oil in Iran. The concession was made valid for 60 years on the condition that the Shah would receive 16% of all the profits. Almost exactly seven years later, on May 26, Darcy finally struck oil. A year later, on April 14, 1909, the Anglo-Persian Oil Company was formed to begin refining and selling the oil. The company is now known today as BP, British Petroleum. By the outbreak of World War I in 1914, Anglo-Persian was exporting over 274,000 tonnes of oil annually, more oil than Anglo-Persian could handle. With the start of World War I looming closer, the British government began to take an interest in Anglo-Persian, as it sought to convert its Royal Navy from coal to oil. On May 20th, 1914, an agreement was made between the British government and Anglo-Persian. The British government would invest £2.2 million into the company and in return would receive 51% of its stocks. The British government now owned a majority share, which effectively nationalised the company. Britain's oil interests had been secured, and would prove vital to Britain's victory during World War I, which would break out just over a month later. By 1950, 40% of the West's oil was being produced in Iran, and 75% of Europe's. This reliance on Iranian oil had caused the British to become deeply entrenched in Iran's politics. Meanwhile, the United States began to find its own oil interests under threat. Following threats by Venezuela to nationalize its own oil, Creole Oil, a subsidiary of the American oil company, Standard Oil of New Jersey, was forced to concede a 50-50 split of its profits. Two years later, following similar threats by Saudi Arabia in 1950, Arabian-American oil company Aramco was also forced into a 50-50 agreement with the Saudi government. Britain would soon find itself in a similar predicament. Inspired by the developments in Venezuela and Saudi Arabia, the Iranians too began to demand a fairer share of the profits. The demand for a revision of the concession, giving around 50% of the profits, and a larger role in the management of the company, were rejected by Britain. On January 11, 1951, the National Front, a moderate nationalist party headed by Mohammad Mossadegh, proposed the nationalization of Iran's oil. As support for nationalization grew, Britain eventually conceded to discuss a 50-50 share of the profits. However, it was now too late. On March 15, the Majlis, Iran's democratically elected National Assembly, unanimously approved Iran's oil nationalization. Nationalization was then later approved by the Iranian Senate on March 20th. Following the resignation of the Prime Minister on April 27th, Mossadegh was appointed as the new Prime Minister. Although disliked the Shah, he was forced to accept his appointment, fearing his enormous popularity. In mid-May, the nationalization process was underway and the National Iranian Oil Company was formed to replace the British Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. The US, under the Truman administration, hoped to remain neutral in the dispute, but was concerned that Britain's actions may turn Iran away from the West and into the hands of the Soviets. By June 10th, the National Iranian Oil Company had taken over operations of the company. The international oil cartel, known as the Seven Sisters, named after the seven oil companies that dominated the oil industry for much of the 20th century, comprised of five American companies, Standard Oil of New Jersey, New York, California, Gulf Oil and Texaco. Through various mergers, the companies now exist today as ExxonMobil and Chevron. The cartel grew concerned that successful nationalization of Iran's oil might inspire others to follow suit. The cartel assisted Britain in enforcing economic sanctions on Iran and boycotting the sale of Iran's oil. Britain and Mossadegh, the Iranian Prime Minister, were at a loggerheads. Britain rejected the legitimacy of the nationalization, while Mossadegh, despite boycotts and heavy sanctions, refused to back down. In May 1951, Britain had already begun to draw up plans to occupy the Iranian oil refinery in Abadan. One of the plans, known as Plan Y, 
called for a land, air and sea assault involving some 70,000 troops. The US, however, opposed the plans, fearing it may spark a Russian occupation, which could in turn bring the US and the Soviets into direct confrontation. Mossadegh hoped the nationalization would boost Iran's economy to help prevent communism taking root. Mossadegh became a hero, not just in the Middle East, but all over the world. His dedication to democratic values and his relentless pursuit of democratic reforms inspired people around the globe. In 1951, he was named Time of the Year by Time magazine in recognition of his achievements. After months of deadlock talks and attempts to take the case to the UN and the World Court, Britain now arrived at the conclusion that it would have to remove Mossadegh from power and install a prime minister more sympathetic to British interests. Under the Truman administration, the US had still played a largely impartial role in the dispute, feeling that British demands for compensation were unreasonable and concerned that removing Mossadegh would bring the communist Tudor party into power. However, when Dwight D. Eisenhower became the new American president in January 1953, U.S. policy changed. Iran was now on the brink of total economic collapse, brought about by Britain's sanctions and an embargo on Iranian oil. In 1950, prior to the nationalization, the Anglo-Iranian oil company exported some 31 million tons of oil. From 1952 to 1953, Iran only managed to export 118,000. Anthony Eden, the British Foreign Secretary under the Churchill government, along with British MI6 intelligence agents, began a campaign to convince the new president that Mossadegh had to be removed if communism were to be prevented from spreading in the region. With no oil settlement in sight, Eisenhower became concerned that Iran's increasingly worse economic situation would provide fertile ground for the spread of Soviet influence.